Today on the Awesome Marriage Podcast, we are continuing our series on healthy boundaries by talking about the logistics of how to set and carry out the boundaries our marriages need for ourselves and our marriages to be their healthiest. So in the past couple episodes, we've given a lot of places where a boundary might need to be set, and today we're going to go deeper on how to make that happen. So Dr. Kim, to start off, how do we know if we need a boundary in a certain area? Well, I think there's certain things that kind of, um, that I see from counseling couples that just kind of are, just arise consistently, certainly conflict, uh, if not in conflict, well, we've talked about that, uh, trust definitely is one. If there's a trust issue, maybe someone had an emotional affair, physical mm-hmm. affair, pornography, whatever boundaries to build, rebuild that trust security. I don't feel safe in the relationship. I don't feel safe financially. What do we need to do to put some boundaries to do that? So things like that, I think, are some of the things that um, are some red flags that pop up Mm -hmm. that a lot of times we don't know what to do with. And yet by sitting down and having a good conversation, both getting on the same page and something um, and saying, okay, well, yeah, let's do this. Let's set a boundary here with our conflict. We're not going to yell. We're not going to fight when we're angry. We're going to build, you know, we're going to trust. You have access to all my passwords, things like that. So you begin to see how boundary can be beneficial in those areas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really good. That's a, um, that's a great way to start looking at it. So once we start realizing that in a topic, we need a boundary, how can we nail down what that boundary needs to be? Okay. Well, think of it. Yeah. Kind of maybe like on conflict that I was saying, okay, Mm -hmm. When are we, are we going to use timeouts? So Mm -hmm. you agree. Okay. That's a boundary. We're, we're going to say if we want either one of us can call the timeout and we're going to split, we're going to go pray. We're going to talk and come back, uh, in conflict, listen, the boundary is you got to listen to each other. If you're trying to talk over me or I say something and it's very obvious you weren't listening to me, you know, the boundary is we got to listen to each other. Um, no raised voices. Got to mention that. I mean, things like that, things that will make a difference in conflict because if you use timeouts and you don't yell at each other and you listen well to each other, you can resolve conflict. Mm-hmm. So those boundaries will make a difference. And the whole thing of trust, which, which I think, unfortunately, a lot of people have to deal with for number. It's not always infidelity. It can be some other areas. But I think, you know, boundary, we're going to be totally honest with each other completely. Mm-hmm. We're going to have accountability, not only with each other, but if we need to have someone else that we're accountable to, to rebuild trust, we're going to do that. Uh, trust. I, you can look at anything I've got. You've got my email. You've got access to my all my social media. You've got access to text. Everything I have, you either got a password or you've got an easy access to that. And so then that begins to take the issue like conflict or trust. What are the things, the boundaries that are going to help us in that area? Mm-hmm. That's good. That's good. So, so this is a process. So it's going to be a process. And I, I heard you mention a, a lot of different options for conflict. Um, I think we can get more into this later, but do you recommend that if you see, for example, four different boundaries you want to draw around your conflict, do you just go ahead and do all of those at once or would you do one at a time? How would you do that? I think it depends on how bad the situation is. You know, if, mm-hmm. if it's really just escalating fast, maybe you'd really just start with, uh, Hey, we're just going to do a timeout and we're going to agree to the timeout. Cause that gives us a chance to, to, to deal with that, to handle that, um, or, and to calm down and come back. Mm-hmm. And maybe that takes care of some of the other things when we take the time to do that. I think you can do too, try to do too many things at one time. And so I think if you can step into it, then that's, that's good. And trust if it's, um, just maybe just, Hey, I was talking to my friends today and -and so-and-so's husband has been texting somebody and stuff like that. I trust you, but I don't have access to your passwords and all that kind of stuff. And not that ever looked, but it just made me feel good if I had access to all your passwords, Mm. if I had access to everything that you have online. And so you bound it. Yeah. We both have access to everything. Now say Mm. someone's had an affair. Well, then you're probably going to put a bunch of things in place on that situation. If you have a hope of building something back to rebuild trust, you got to count count dinner. Like we talked, you've got to have, um, you know, access to everything. There's other things that go into that. So I think a lot of can depend on what the situation is and how severe it is. And, um, but I think if you can start out with just one thing and build on it, I think that really helps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. So it could be definitely a varying scale depending on where you are. 
Yes. Okay. Um, that's helpful. So I think let's talk about the logistics of a boundaries conversation. So one of the things you said in a recent episode was not trying to resolve conflict when you're angry, but if you've got some built up like conflict or some resentment or something's been going on for a long time, that's going to be hard. So how do you do this? Well, I think you've got to talk about it outside of when you're upset. And so, okay, hey, we've been fighting about this, or we've been fighting for consistently all this time. We're not getting anywhere. We're getting mad at each other. Things are not good. Can we sit down and talk about it? And so I think that's an important thing is just set, just setting aside the time and holding that time sacred and getting rid of distractions so mm -hmm. you can really, really talk about it. And you've got to both be willing to do that. Mm -hmm. And if you can do it, the two of you, that's great. If you need to put in a counselor or something like that, that's that's whatever it takes to begin to, to resolve things. I think it, and yeah, I thought of an example. I think sometimes it always helps. We always like to have something like, I think they call it the sandwich method where you say a couple, mm -hmm. something good, then something, and then something good at the end. Like, if, mm -hmm. uh, so you say, I think we're really doing good at spending more quality time together, but I'm missing some of my alone time, which I really need. Can we talk about how I can have some alone time? And mm -hmm. so you're complimenting something that you're doing good, but you're also saying, but this is what I really need too. And so I think sometimes that really helps soften it. It's, it's like you're saying, Hey, we're doing good. I love it. Mm -hmm. I love the time we spend together, but just the way I'm wired, I, I need some alone time. And I realize I'm not getting that and I'm really feeling the effects of that. And I think I'm going to be better for me and better for you and better for a family. If I can work out how to have that alone time too, can we work on that? So I think that's a really good thing. Uh, then explaining the boundaries. So if you take that situation a little bit farther, uh, I'd like to have 30 minutes in the morning where I know I can be alone. Mm -hmm. I need time to think. I need time to pray. I need to set my time for the day. And, and when I get interrupted, I have trouble getting focused again. Mm -hmm. And so then your spouse can say, yeah, I can walk in on you all the time, don't I? You'll be in there having that 30 minutes and I'll come in while I'm shaving and tell you a, ba a basketball school or something. Mm -hmm. So I'm interrupting you. Okay, so that gives that why you need the boundary and it gives that information because the other spouse may not have a clue what they're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, consequences are hard. I mean, I think and we'll talk some more about that, but a consequence of something like that is, you know, <clears throat> maybe, maybe, okay. Uh, I, you need to go get ready in a different part of the house, or maybe mm -hmm. I need to go have my quiet time in a different part of the house. Uh, those kind of things. And so I think mm -hmm. that's kind of, uh, I think the way the conversation that go, um, you know, I think another boundary, you know, if you're having trouble with uh, escalation or maybe raise voices at each other, that a boundary can be, you know, I, uh, I think when you raise your voice at me, it scares me. Uh, I shut down. I don't feel like I can communicate with you. And I either seems like either withdraw or I fight back and say something I shouldn't. So in the future, if you raise your voice at me, I'm going to remind you, and then if you do it again, I'm going to leave the situation. And so you've set a boundary there with a consequence because you're trying to set something that will protect you, your spouse, your marriage, and make things better. Staying in there and yelling at each other is not going to do that. Boundary mm -hmm. is, okay, if we're going to get in that situation, I'm going to leave. I'm just not going to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are good. Those are great examples too. I mean, really good, like tangible, real-life, practical examples. Um, and I think, I think that's really good. I, even before the conversation, I think it's good that you set up, it has to be a time where both are able to be mentally present, no distractions. Um, and I think agreeing on a time that works for both. I don't think it can be like, Hey, I've got boundaries. I'm going to set with you. I need you to sit down and listen. It, I think it has to be a both people agree on this. And I love the, um, the sandwich method. I think that's helpful because then it's not just like this. Hey, everything's awful. And, <laughs> and I, I've, I've been guilty of proposing things in that way <laughs> right. by accident, just because it's what's on my mind. It's top of mind. So I'm thinking, oh, I've got to get this yes. resolved. <clears throat> but that's not really doing the best job communicating what I want to communicate. Yeah. And I think it's, and it's, to me, it always helps when I stop and think of something positive to put in there, mm -hmm. because then it kind of resets my mindset too. It, it puts a little positive spin on whatever I'm trying to deal with or whatever I might think is negative. And I think that's helpful for me in communicating. I think I communicate mm -hmm. better when I take time to do that. Mm -hmm. and the whole world is not caving in. It's this yeah. one thing here that I want to talk about. Right. We've got a great yes. world over here, but this thing is something that, that we need to talk about. Yeah. 
Yeah. When I guess, I guess the follow up to that is what if the world is not great? Like what if it's a really tough season in the marriage? You know, it's going to be a little different then, but can, can you still kind of start to get some forward progress through this? I think we have to, or I think we'll continue to, you know, I don't think we say it a lot. I say it a lot. The marriage doesn't stand still. It either goes forward or backward. And mm. so in tough seasons, the tendency is to go backward. But I have so many couples I've seen and work with that have grown their marriage through difficult times. Mm. And so it may be that you do need a third party, either a mentor mm -hmm. couple or a, a Christian counselor to sit down with you. And so don't put that off. I've had people tell me, you know, we should have come five years ago. Well, mm. I, I know you should have. We, we'd mm. be so much better off if you'd started this five years ago instead of now. Mm -hmm. So take that step, whatever it is. If you try it by yourself, try it by yourself first. And if mm -hmm. it's not working, say, hey, we need some help in this. Do you agree? And then say, okay, let's, hey, you know that couple that the pastor told us about that's, you know, they're about 20 years older than us and they've been through so much and he thought they would really be good to to come alongside us and help us, let's call them and have mm. dinner with them. Or, you know, my, our neighbors down the block, you know, they were having some problems that were kind of similar to what we're dealing with. Mm. And they found this great Christian counselor. Let's make an appointment with that person. Just take that step. Don't let it just continue to go and fester because it's amazing how, when you put things off, how quickly a month, a year, five years can happen, you know, and mm -hmm. you just have never dealt with it. And it's not just staying there. Your marriage is getting worse. Or maybe you have a bump forward, but you're then they're taking two bumps backwards and you want to continue to try to do things to move your marriage forward. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I really appreciate that you can share the experience of you've seen some really tough marriages turn around. That's super hopeful and encouraging for all of us too. Yes, it is. I mean, it, it, it's just funny when you realize when you quit fighting each other and fight together, and, mm -hmm. and seek God, good things can begin to happen. Sure, you still got things to work through. It's not like all of a sudden you're going to get this magic potion from God that's going to make everything okay, because I think for some reason, God usually wants us to work through things that we're, and deal with it and know that with his help, we can come out on the other side instead of him just giving us a rescue rope all the time. Sometimes mm -hmm. we need the rescue rope, and sometimes he gives that. But a lot of times I think he wants to teach us and grow us and walk through something with us. So hmm. um, if we do that, you, there's so much hope. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's, that's kind of the purpose of getting so down in the details today about how to make this happen. Because I think wherever your marriage is, if it's just maybe one thing that you need to deal with, or if it's like really tough right now, um, there, there's a way to move forward in that. And I think what you're saying to start out with Dr. Kim is like, let's address this outside of anger. Let's address this as a we thing, not a me versus you. And so that's a great place to start. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, so going forward. Okay. So say you've got one thing, um, Let's go back to the example of the interruption during 30 minutes, because that was such a specific example. What if the other spouse doesn't want to agree to the boundary? They have some pushback or they just, they're not on board. What do you do? Well, there's only one person you control and you know that, and it's you. And sometimes that's a really hard lesson for us to, to learn. <laughs> I mean, I really thought for a long time I could control Nancy, uh, but that never worked out. So then your boundary really is going to come from you. Um, mm. And, and I think sometimes we set boundaries and we get the pushback and we give in. And so mm. what's a good example? Say, um, I never mind when you ask me to drive my car. In fact, I love that you enjoy driving my car. It, but it seems like every time you drive it on the weekend and I get in to go to work on Monday, the gas gauge is on empty. So I need you to make sure there's enough gas in the car to get me started on the week. And if it happens again... I can't let you drive my car on the weekend anymore. Mm -hmm. And so I think, so the pushback would be that, you know, they drive your car again and they bring it home and you get in on Monday morning and, oh, I'm out of gas. I got to stop the gas on the way to office. Monday morning's hectic. The traffic's mm -hmm. horrible. And now I got to stop and get gas again. And so, so the consequence is that you follow through on that consequence. So, if, so that would be one example. I think when a, when a spouse pushes back or says something like, uh, well, that's silly or that's stupid. If we use the example of, the quiet time in that, okay, you can't change your spouse. Maybe your spouse keeps coming in the bedroom while you're doing your quiet time. So then your role is, okay, I'm going to go outside on the patio or I'm going to go something mm -hmm. here or I'm going to wait till he goes to work or she goes to work to do that. 
Um, mm-hmm. So I think you can work around those to, to get what you want. It's always going to be kind of have an asterisk by it if your spouse hasn't been all in on it with you. Hmm. When you can set a boundary and your spouse says, I get it, I understand. Uh, maybe you don't even like it, but yeah, I know you need this and so I'm willing to do it. That's really healthy. If you set mm-hmm. a boundary and your spouse said, well, that's just stupid. I can walk in this bedroom anytime I want to walk in this bedroom. Mm-hmm. Well, so you move to the patio to do your quiet time. But there's some resentment that's going to go there. Mm-hmm. And so you're getting what you wanted, but it's got this asterisk by it. And mm-hmm. so I think, um, I think it's, as a couple, a couple's listening to this is, is really learning to understand and respect each other's boundaries and to validate those and to follow through with those. Because when you give some pushback, it's going to have a negative result, even if they still mm-hmm. get what they want. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. And I think that in that case, it's like they're, you're kind of missing that teamwork aspect that we want to see. You know, you can still, you can't change your spouse. You can never control your spouse and you don't even want to, but you do want to be able to work together. Yes. And that's, you know, that's probably where counseling is going to have to be a part of it, honestly, Mm -hmm. Lindsay, because Mm -hmm. there's something deeper there than just some, some say that's a silly boundary or Mm -hmm. something like that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Why, why are you not even respecting or listening to your spouse in this area? And Mm -hmm. we need someone that can help us communicate well enough to each other so we can understand where each other is coming from. Mm -hmm. And, and, and so that's where I think counseling can be so helpful for somebody. Yeah, absolutely. And then even if I'll say something, I was going to say, sometimes I say something in counseling um, and, and, and the spouse will say, that's what I've been telling them for six months. And the spouse (laughs) said, yeah, but he, he just said it different, (laughs) but I didn't. It was just like, you know, it was coming from me instead of them. And so uh, it's kind of funny when that happens. I never laugh, but I think to myself, yeah, "Yeah, it's just, it's just amazing how funny we are as people. And, and, you know, we can say, I can say the exact same thing. I've told, I've had parents tell me that. Mm-hmm. My kid said, you told them to do this and they're doing it. Yeah. I told them that every day for a year. And yeah. they said, I know, I know. Yeah. Just, I don't just accept it. Enjoy it. <laughs> yeah. Just take it. Yeah. No, that's a great point. I think, um, there, there's something too, to be said for, if you know that you need some support or some counseling in that area and your spouse is not willing to go, it still will be helpful if you go by yourself in that situation because then you can learn some other ways to start communicating these things and start dealing with the one person you can change, which is yourself. When we're talking about starting to implement these boundaries, you gave us a great example about the car Mm -hmm. on Monday morning. What are some other examples of ways to implement? Yeah, I think, uh, well, certainly you're having the conversation. You both want to make sure you both understand or are clear on the boundary. And that's really important because sometimes I've worked with couples and one has set a boundary and it goes back to listening and communication and they really didn't get it. Mm. And so you want to make sure you're clear on that and the consequences and you follow through. All that kind of stuff moves your marriage forward. And if you mm-hmm. don't, or if you don't follow through or don't, aren't consistent with consequences, then it'll go backwards. Um, so say one of the things that, uh, say Nancy hurts her back and, and vacuuming the house is not, is difficult for her. So the boundary for the next four weeks while she heals is that she can't vacuum and she needs me to do that each week. And so I agree to do that. She can't, I'm going to do it for her. Um, and that one probably the consequence is if I don't do it, it's dirty corporate and my wife's going to be ticked at me. Uh, <laughs> So maybe that's not the best example, but I think it's something that sometimes, um, you know, she's asking for something, I agree to it, and then I don't do it. Mm -hmm. Uh, Let's look at trust. You say we want to build trust, uh, so we agree to give each other access to everything, like we've talked about, messaging, emails, social media, all that kind of stuff. Um, And the boundary is that nothing is hidden Mm -hmm. from each other. The consequence is if you add a social media account and you don't get, tell your spouse about it or you change your spas- password on something and don't tell them that the consequence of that one is tough because it's broken trust. Mm-hmm. And so I think those kind of things, uh, when you implement it, you want to be able to, to make it clear what the consequences are and you can, you guys both got to be all in on it. I mean, if I agree to being really faithful with social media and all that kind of stuff, and I verbalize that, I don't really 
no, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. I'd say that mm -hmm. to myself. Well, then that's not going to be good at all. And so that's not mm -hmm. going to, um, and I think, you know, pretty quickly, you know, in counseling, I know pretty quickly if we're setting some boundaries and saying some things, if the per if both people are already in on it or not, mm -hmm. usually by a couple mm -hmm. of weeks, we've set a boundary. Um, and one's it, following it when another one in on it, it's going to come out. Mm -hmm. And so then we got to go back to square one again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Another plug for counseling, because that sounds like it'd be really helpful to have, to have that third voice there, the third party. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, because if you try your boundaries and it's not working, it's not that boundaries aren't working. And maybe you're not setting the boundary exactly in a way that works for you as a couple, things mm -hmm. like that. A counselor can help you refine those things. It doesn't mean that boundaries don't work. A boundary's not good. It just may be for your marriage or where you are in your marriage or you're both not all in or something that a counselor can help you all identify and work through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. That's really good. Um, so let's talk about, we talked about sort of starting to implement boundaries. Well, uh, you know, the book boundaries, which is a great resource to read if you're, if you're getting into this or there's boundaries in marriage or in dating, um, Cloud and Townsend, the authors of that say that boundaries need to be enforceable. Why is that essential? Hmm. Well, the, if the boundary is there to make things better and there's not a consequence when it's crossed, why do you even have the boundary in the first place? Mm -hmm. I mean, at that point, it's not enforceable. Uh, it just becomes like a word of of a, a request that you do to somebody and say, say a wife says to her husband, uh, I don't ever want you to talk to another woman. Well, that's pretty broad. Mm -hmm. I mean, so... He, that's probably not something that's going to be uh, enforceable uh, because of just the way life is. But if she, instead the spouse says, I'm uncomfortable with you talking to our next door neighbor, Christy, mm. without me present, hmm. then that's very specific. And the consequences is that if you cross that boundary, I'm going to go and talk to her hmm. and I'm going to tell her that I don't want y'all to have conversations anymore or, what, or whatever mm. it is, or I'm selling the house and we're moving or <laughs> whatever it is. But I mean, I think it's, it, you, you've got to have something. I think a boundary has to be very specific. Mm -hmm. can't be real broad. Mm -hmm. It's got to be, and then it's got to be enforceable. It'll be real clear if she sees him in the yard talking to Christy and she drives up or she's in the house and she mm -hmm. looks out and sees that, that boundary has been crossed. And so then the next step is what I do. I'm, and I, I'm going to go to Christine. And I'm going to say, I'm really uncomfortable. I, mm. You may be pure in your thoughts, but I'm uncomfortable when you're talking to my husband and I'm mm -hmm. asking you to not do that with him unless I'm present. Because mm -hmm. he can't seem to control himself. He probably mm -hmm. would say that part. But. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's a great, that's a great example. I think that's really helpful. I think, um, so there's, there could be a lot of different ways to enforce the boundary. They'll probably all differ depending on what the boundary is, but I do think making it really specific will help to kind of figure out what the appropriate consequence yes. would be. And it's difficult to use a, a word like consequence because it, the purpose is not punishment. It's not to punish and it's not to teach someone a lesson. It's just Absolutely. to make the boundary applicable. Um, so I think when we're thinking about when we're thinking about that, I think one of the big pitfalls is um, is that the boundaries might seem like a punishment or like a control, but it's really not that at all, is it, Dr. Kim? No, no, it shouldn't be at all. It should never be a punishment. It's just like, you know, one of the things that I think is so good, philosophies and raising kids is um, natural and logical consequences. You know, you leave mm -hmm. your back, bike out in the in the rain and it gets rusty. Well, your consequence is you're, you got a rusty bike. I mean, it, mm -hmm. and so it should be something that follows along to enforce something of you're supposed to put your bike in the garage at night. Mm -hmm. If you do, that's the boundary. You do that. If you don't, then you're going to have a consequence there. So it's, it's to make your marriage healthier. It's to make your marriage better. It's not, you never, I said that earlier. I think you never want to get where it's a parent child situation. Yeah. And if it's punishment, then you're in a parent child situation. And mm -hmm. nobody wants to be in that with their spouse. No, absolutely not. No, that's not healthy. Yeah. So as we continue to talk about how to enforce the boundary, did you have any other examples or thoughts on that? Um, 
I think too, when we just start with boundaries, I think for a lot of us, it might be a process if we haven't used them before. Mm-hmm. Uh, and sometimes it's kind of learning how to refine that. Um, and so your really goal is to, to define what you're comfortable with and how would you would like others to treat you. It's to communicate to the other person what you need or mm-hmm. how you want that to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, then the consequence will become uh, someone walking over that boundary. Mm-hmm. And so enforcing the boundary is making sure it's followed really, mm-hmm. you know, and, and so it's, it's that process. And so I think if you, if you're just starting out as a couple and you're starting to set some boundaries, you, you're going to learn as you go, because you mm-hmm. may set a boundary that maybe there's something a little, a little bit unrealistic in it or something like that. And you don't know till you kind of get in that. So um, it, just let that be a process where mm-hmm. you can get it where the, it's very clear consequences, mm-hmm. very clear. And, um, so the force really, if the consequence is set up ahead of time and it's very clear, the enforcement's pretty easy across yeah. the boundary. Um, I can't drive my car. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah. can we go back to, yeah. to another example that you gave us, um, just talking about the conflict boundary. So if you had, mm-hmm. if both spouses had agreed to not raise their voice, say, for example, um, so one example I've heard you use as an enforcement for that is, okay, if you do, then I'll, I'll leave, or maybe I'll give you a reminder and then I'll leave. Are there any other ways that you would enforce that? I think when someone's raised their voice, I think once you get into escalation, you're not going to have a good conversation usually. Mm-hmm. And so I think probably um, leaving is probably going to be the best situ- solution in that situation. Mm-hmm. Cause probably if someone's angry, anything you say is going to make them angrier. Mm. Now you can also, one thing that sometimes works is, is having a buzzword. And mm-hmm. so if mm-hmm. one of us says this words, we shut things down. And mm-hmm. so maybe your buzzword is purple. Mm-hmm. And so escalating and say, instead of saying, I'm leave, you can say purple. Mm-hmm. Maybe that rings different. Maybe, maybe walking away with your spouse, um, uh, causes more anxiety mm-hmm. because they were abandoned, felt had feelings of abandonment in the past or mm-hmm. as a child growing up. And so saying purple is, a, it makes it feel more like, Oh, this is for us. This is for mm-hmm. our marriage. I am raising my voice. Mm-hmm. I need to stop that. And so um, I'm glad you brought that up because I think that you've got to find what works for you. And, and so if a mm-hmm. consequence all of a sudden has other things, attached to it that you didn't mm-hmm. even know about, like, mm-hmm. you know, the feelings of abandonment that I've dealt with. And now, mm-hmm. oh my gosh, my husband or wife is walking away too. Mm-hmm. Uh, that can cause some real problems. So it's, it's, yeah. um, and it's okay. I think to, to say, okay, this is what seems like the right consequence. Do you agree with that? What mm-hmm. would be, or, you know, sometimes it's, I, and we should do this with our kids. So I'm okay. This is your curfew or this is your rule. What should the consequence be? And usually mm-hmm. they would come up something that was <laughs> tougher than we would and we'd say, okay, we'll do <laughs> yeah. that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and I think the same thing you can say, is, is, is that fair? And then your spouse can say, well, you know, it probably is fair, but because of my past, that's mm-hmm. going to be really hard for me. Can we mm-hmm. think of something else? Mm-hmm. And kind of, again, you yeah. can even process the consequence together. Because yeah. if your big picture goal is to make your marriage better, mm-hmm. then you both need to be working on it. And, you know, it's not yeah. one person against the other. And if you're again, talking about boundaries and something that's really tough, like there's been physical abuse or something like that, that's a whole different story. Now, mm-hmm. those are something when, you know, um, somebody may need to separate, may need to get mm-hmm. out, may need to physically mm-hmm. get out, not just walk away to another room to get in the car mm-hmm. and go somewhere safe, things like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, but things we're talking about are just general things that happen in most marriages at some point during the marriage relationship. Yeah, that's really good. And I I like that you gave us a couple different creative ideas there because I think collaborating on the consequence uh, could be really helpful. And I can also think right off the bat, I could think of situations where you mentioned the past abandonment and I don't know how many people are like fully in touch with those past feelings you know, a lot of us have not done a lot of counseling or have not dealt with everything. So that could be hitting home for a lot of people, but they never would have realized that and connected the dots because they haven't processed through it. So it's interesting. I know a lot of stuff that we're bringing into marriage where we need the boundaries is probably stuff we need to deal with on our own at times, but this is showing how it's really a tool to help us 
yeah. step into those things helpfully without triggering all of our past stuff that's still in there. It is. And that's why I think it's got to be a work in process. You know, sometimes a mm -hmm. couple will come in and they say, well, we did this and we tried this boundary and it, it's not working. And so we kind of dig mm -hmm. and then we can, can come up with something like that. Uh, and sometimes it's hard for a couple to do on their own. Maybe, maybe you can pray about it and God will reveal that to you. Certainly that happens. But again, mm -hmm. it may be a time that a counselor can help you work through that. If you hit some roadblocks, uh, go to counseling, help them figure mm. it out. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, get some help. That's really good. Um, and, I, uh, you know, would of course recommend yeah. the boundaries books that we mentioned a minute ago that gives some more tangibles to this, you know, go much deeper even. That's good. Yeah, it's a great book. Um, so I feel like we've talked a lot about the enforcement and I love that you're just kind of saying this is, it's just another way to have a deeper conversation with each other to go into those things, um, and to work together more. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I, I do want to touch on two boundaries outside of the marriage. Cause we've talked at this point about having boundaries outside the marriage with family, with friends, with others. And so for example, um, I know that you've dealt with this plenty in counseling, but say you have to set an example with an in-law or family member. What are some ideas for enforcing those boundaries? Yeah. And I, unfortunately, a lot of couples have to deal with that. Mm -hmm. I would say that I think one as a couple, if you're trying to set a boundary to protect your marriage, your family, then you set the boundary together. Mm -hmm. And so, okay, my dad, comes over unannounced, walks in the door. Mm -hmm. We gave him a key. I don't know why I gave him a key, but we gave him a key. <laughs> and, you know, one time he came in and we were in bed. Mm. One time he came in and I was just walking out of the shower. You know, this can't go on. And we've asked him and he'll go, oh, yeah. And then the next week he's walking in again at some time. And so you say, okay, um, that's your dad. Let's talk about the, the boundary and the consequence. And you're the one who needs to communicate. I think anytime you're communicating through family of origin, it's best if all possible for the child, adult child of that family to communicate that. Mm -hmm. um, it just seems to work better that way. Mm -hmm. So the boundary is um, you go to, okay, you're going to talk to your dad. You're going to ask for the key back. You say, we'd love you to come over. We're not saying don't come over. We just need you to call, see if it's a good time. Most of the time, it's, we're going to say yes. It's not mm -hmm. like we're just trying to control everything. But there's times that, that we need privacy. There's times that we have something else going on. Maybe we're having a study time with the kids. Maybe we're whatever it is. Maybe it's a nap time. Mm -hmm. But so we want you to to, uh, to call before you come. We're getting the key back is a huge thing. Mm -hmm. um, that way, that takes access away. Mm -hmm. and so they, um, you know, the consequence also could be so he shows up the next day, he is standing outside the door. He did ring the doorbell, mm. but he didn't call. Don't don't answer the door. Mm. And then you can text him later and said, you know, we were taking a nap when you came by. Uh, if you would have called or let us know, uh, we would help the kids up a little bit before nap time. Or we would have said, hey, they're down for a nap. What, can you come in an hour? Mm -hmm. And, and so you begin to enforce it that way. Mm -hmm. So I, does that help? I mean, I think that's kind of what you've got to do. And, and it and you've got to work together um, and you've got to agree on the problem. Mm -hmm. And it is a problem for both of you. And then mm -hmm. you've got to agree on the solution and the consequences. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. That's really good and practical, um, a tangible example. Um, I think one follow-up question I do have for that, because just because I've seen it happen so many times, what if the adult child of that parent does not see the issue as much as their spouse does. And their spouse is desperate for them to take that stand and make that boundary, but they are not seeing it in the way that their spouse is. So they don't want to have to step up and take that hard conversation. Yeah, that that's tough. I, I think it goes back to, I would go to a third party to talk mm -hmm. about that. Uh, somebody maybe to validate, is this really an issue mm -hmm. or is it not an issue? And then if the counselor, whoever you're talking to validates that, then how do we handle that? Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's another thing too, in, in a marriage and um, in general, if something's important to Nancy, I want to make it important to me. Mm -hmm. So it may not bother me that my dad came by and he'd just walk in and, 
Yeah, we'd sit down and I'd be watching a game and he'd sit down and watch the game with me. Great. I never thought anything about that. Mm -hmm. But what if that bothered Nancy? Because she said, what if I was there with you? What if I just had my robe on and just got out of the shower? What if this? What if that? Mm -hmm. Then I need to value what she's saying and say, hey, dad, uh, love you coming over to watch the game with me, but call first mm -hmm. just in case. Mm -hmm. And and you put that out there like that. So I, I think it's it's making something important to you because it's important to your spouse. And I think mm -hmm. sometimes when we, it's not important to us, we tend to minimize it or to blow mm -hmm. it off. And I don't think that's good. We, our spouse needs to know that we heard them. And mm -hmm. I don't know what is all is going on with Nancy, where she had asked me to do something like that from the past or whatever it is. And it's not, you know, it's not time for me to sit down or for us to go have a counseling session over, just say, okay, I can do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'll tell him. And mm -hmm. Next time he calls and says, hey, the game starts at three. Is it okay if I come and watch it with you? Ask Nancy. Yeah, that's great. Come, mm -hmm. it's okay. Again, it's just it's putting some things in place to um, to just make it healthier. Where sometimes parents, um, and I think um, the, my experience has been the younger couple is getting married. Sometimes it's harder with the parents mm -hmm. in intruding because uh, mm -hmm. they haven't made that separation they still see you as just one big family of origin mm -hmm. instead of <laughs> yes you have the family of origin but you also have this new family so sometimes you have to set some boundaries to establish this like um parents have sunday dinner every night everybody's expected to be there so we do this every night for six every sunday for six months and one of the the spouse says you know i don't i, I would love that we had a couple of sundays a month where it was just us at home with our family or mm -hmm. just the two of us at home together where we can just relax, get ready for the new week, just kind of enjoy just hanging out together. And so it's like, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. So it's okay then to say to your parents, mom, we're going to come. We'd love that you fixed dinner. We're going to come the first and third Sunday of our month. Mm -hmm. Others, we're going to stay home because we think that we just need that time. And if your parents are healthy, you're going to say, that's great you need it. They're going to understand the value in that. And if they don't, then it's like, this is what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. And and we're not going to let you manipulate us or, or say, well, you know, your dad's pretty sick. He may not be here that third Sunday next week right. you know, no, <laughs> or something like that. Right. So you, so you don't want to get into that. And so I, I think it is some, some parents, my parents made it so easy. In fact, Nancy, we'd been married about two months and we'd seen my parents, I guess, but Nancy said, did they not like us anymore? <laughs> it was because they knew how important it was to give us space and time. And so we kind of had to say, hey, it's okay to ask us over. It's okay to mm -hmm. do things and things like that. We're okay with that, you know. But they were waiting for us to set that, which was really, mm -hmm. really, really nice. Um, and it made a, a big difference for us. And I've seen other places where, you know, parents don't want anything to change. It's like, mm -hmm. yeah, you've got her or you got him, but we're not changing anything else. And mm -hmm. you're expected here and there and all that kind of stuff. I know. It's got to change. They've got to see you as a separate entity. I know a lot of people listening are that's thinking, a great thing oh, you brought man. up because I think that's something. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, yeah. It, and I think the sooner you do it as a newlywed, mm -hmm. the better. The longer you let it go on, the harder it's going to be. You mm -hmm. start establishing this. This is a different relationship I'm in now. This is new. We can do some things different. We love you so much. We thank you that you got us to this point. But this is what we can do and this is what we can do. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and sometimes you get some pushback. Sometimes you don't. Some parents understand. Some don't. But you, you've got to do what's right for you. I had, parent, I had some couple families this year that decided that Christmas day was going to be just them and their kids at home mm. all day. Uh, they had never done that. They'd talked about it. Uh, so they, they, we'd talked about it. And so they gave the information out pretty early. It was like first of October. So it's not, it wasn't like Christmas Eve. They were saying, we're not coming over. Right. <laughs> uh, got a lot of pushback and stuff like that, but everybody survived. And I talked to them afterwards and their kids were ecstatic. Mm. He said, you know, the kids stayed in their pajamas till three in the afternoon. We just sat around. I cooked breakfast and we played with their toys and we watched a movie and all mm. that kind of stuff. And so it was just a really special time for their family. And that's okay if you do that. You're not being mean to somebody for not doing that. Mm -hmm. And as parents and grandparents, we just have to understand those things that, that 
we get, we're entering into new seasons. So the things that we enjoyed and loved in the past season may not transfer to this new season, but embrace what is in this new season. Maybe that means that Christmas Eve, you do something really, really special for all of them because you're not going to see them on Christmas Day. Or maybe mm-hmm. you do something something else to to do that. And then you plan something for yourself for Christmas Day um, so you don't sit around going, I wish the kids were there all day. Mm-hmm. You know, that you're, you're plan something good for the two of you. And so kind of took a rabbit trail, but I thought it was a good place <laughs> to do it. No, that's really good. I think we need all those examples because when you were talking about your family, how your parents were so accommodating, I think a lot of people were probably going, oh, that is not fair. We didn't have that experience at all. We had the opposite. And so I think a lot of people are dealing with this. It's great to have those examples. Yeah. And I, you know, I haven't told that much, but my parents loved. And so <laughs> that, that just shows that there was, a, there was, uh, and my grandparents, on both sides, I loved, and they just, my parents were pretty young and they eloped and, you know, there wasn't a lot of uh, support for that. And so they, they knew how valuable it was to have that time for mm. them to build the relationship in marriage. And so I think they just, they thought through that and carried that over into Nancy and I, when we got married, it was, and it was really cool. It was a blessing because it's, it's mm. probably not the norm in most situations. Mm-hmm. No, I, I don't think so, <laughs> but that's really sweet. That's yeah. cool. Yeah. Um, well, so as we're kind of wrapping up this conversation about boundaries, um, if we have a lot of things we're thinking of right now, our mind just spinning with all these different possibilities or places in our life that we might need to start setting boundaries, how do we start? Do we do a lot of things at once? Do we start with one at a time? Where do you begin? Yeah, how do we practically do that? I, I think... Um, when you set a boundary, you got to make sure, kind of reiterate, reiterate a few things. So I said, it's very clear and it's very specific. Mm-hmm. Uh, it doesn't need to be broad. Like you can't talk to any women ever right. again in your life. I mean, that's just like going, okay, you know, I'm also going to lock you in a cell. No, you right. can't do that. Uh, communicate clear, clear, clearly, <laughs> make sure your spouse understands it. That's really important too. And sometimes mm-hmm. we just don't, or the spouse acts like they do or doesn't listen. So that communicate the consequences. You got to be consistent. And, and then I think too, going back to what we said about not punishment, it is don't overreact if the boundaries crossed. Hmm. It's okay to give a reminder, mm-hmm. you know, and, and then and reiterate it. And then you can put the consequence in if you need to do that. But I mean, this is a, for those of you who are just starting out doing boundaries, it takes, um, it takes time. Mm-hmm. It takes time for both of you to understand and get on that and make that a part of of what you do in your marriage. Mm-hmm. So let me give you an example. So, uh, so you're constantly trying to lose weight. It's a struggle. And while you're doing this, your spouse keeps making these snide remarks about your weight. So mm-hmm. the boundary is that you come to your spouse and say, I'm really working on this hard. I'm working out, I'm going to the gym. I'm, I'm eating the healthy things. It's just not coming off like I want to, but your snide remarks really hurt me. So the boundary becomes, please don't make any more snide remarks about my weight. Hmm. And the consequence is that if you do, I'm going to walk out of the room. I'm going to remove myself from you because it's hurtful. Um, and then you've got to follow through with it. You've got to, you got to walk mm-hmm. away. You've got to remind them. You've got to help them break that habit by doing that. Mm-hmm. Uh, remind them, say, Hey, we weren't getting, remember you agreed to that boundary. You weren't going to say that anymore, but you did. And always keeping the goal is to make your marriage healthier. It's not to, punish each other it's to say that hurts when you say that mm-hmm. please don't say that if you do i'm not going to be around you at that time mm-hmm. and so real practical ways to do that to make your point and it's not being mean to your spouse it's helping them understand how to love you better mm-hmm. yeah well really and in that example and a lot of the examples it's just being kind and considerate of the other person uh, i think that sometimes maybe yes. we don't realize that we haven't considered them until you kind of run up into a boundary to stop you. And so it's, it's a good way. It's, you know, I think about that with kids, people say kids love boundaries, even though they don't want them or don't like them, but really boundaries to children bring security. If they know my, my parent cares enough to put Mm -hmm. this enforcement here, that's a security for them. And so kind of, it can work the same way in a marriage. If we say, Hey, no, I'm, I'm not okay with being, you know, in this heated escalated argument, let's walk away, let's cool down or whichever thing you're talking about. It's kind of saying, okay, we're going to agree 
to have a different standard for ourselves. And we're going to set that together because we care enough about this marriage to, you know, put those things in place that we're going to step into a healthier place. That's really good. Yeah. I think it, it's realizing it's not your spouse trying to control you. Mm-hmm. It's your spouse telling you how to love them better to make your marriage better, Mm -hmm. to help them uh, to put any barriers that might be there between growing your marriage and relationship. And so Mm -hmm. if you just reframe that, then boundaries become something that is like, well, I'm so thankful that she set that boundary Mm -hmm. because now I know that that bothered her or that upset her. Or when I Mm -hmm. did that, that was not good for our marriage. And now I can, I can honor that. Mm -hmm. And that's, you're going to have a better marriage because of that. And it's working as a yeah. team together in that. And so setting a boundary is not being mean to your spouse. Setting a boundary is giving them information that they really need to do better at loving you. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's so good. That's such a good way to look at it. Um, so this conversation has been really full of information. It's been packed. Do you have any final piece of advice for us, Dr. Kim? Uh I hope people, yeah, one of the things I wanted to do in this is kind of diffuse the fact that boundaries are, you know, they're not rules, they're not regulations, they're not laws, they're something to help your marriage. I want you to see it that way. And so then when you do that and come in that I'm not trying to punish my spouse, I'm trying to Mm -hmm. give them information to make our marriage better, that then you begin to see the value in boundaries and how those Mm -hmm. can work to make your marriage better. And that's really what I want. And if you haven't set boundaries, I would encourage you to to pick an area that you feel like, hey, this would really be make our marriage better and communicate that to each other. Take that first step. Oh, that's so good. That's so good. Well, I, I've loved this conversation about boundaries and how to set them. And your wisdom on this is so helpful, Dr. Kim, because you have so many great examples to draw from. That's super helpful. Um, so as you're listening, if you have not subscribed to our podcast email list yet, please do so because that's where we put our noteworthy quotes, our bonus content, our application questions. We try our best to make this podcast be practically applicable to you in your marriage, wherever you are today. That's really our goal. And so make sure to find that link in the show notes. You could subscribe. If you have any questions, you can email us at info at awesome and we will answer you. Have a great day and do something awesome for your marriage today.